Okay, here we are. We're in again in Yaakov, and we're uh, in Brachot, the Gemara Brachot, page 17. So it says that Mara bridge Rav Huna, uh, Mara, the son of Rav Yehuda, Bar uh, Batar Tzulute, after he would finish davening the Shmona Esri, every again, this is after finishing the Amidah that we say every day, three times a day. So he would say, Elokai uh, Nisoshoni Meira, my God, guard my tongue from speaking evil. By the way, those who have done a Esri will recognize this because this is part of what we do say, actually. He says, God, please, uh, guard my, speak, uh, my lips from. Uh, my tongue, excuse me, from speaking evil, usfatai, and my lips, midabir mirama, from speaking uh, uh, with deception, limkalalai, and for those who curse uh, nafshi my soul, he don't let it be silent, v'nafshi ka'afar l'koltia, and let my soul be like dust to everything. Okay? And then he says, further, patatli bi b'toratecha, open my heart to your Torah, and let my soul pursue your mitzvot. And save me, me pegara, from a bad hit. From the evil inclination. This we don't say. We don't say this part. From a bad woman. We call ra'ot hamit And all evil that will uh, attach itself or meet us uh, in this world. And anybody who has who has bad thoughts about me, who has tries to conceive of plans to, to hurt me. Okay? So quickly to take uh, just take away or stop their counsel. The kill kill machotam and spoil their thoughts. And he hands off with he hears song in Rafi that it should be the will that the, the things of my uh, lips of my mouth the heggy only be and the meditation of my heart the finesse should be few Hashem Shavit Gwali Hashem my rock and my redeemer Ad, uh, and some people say uh, until my rock and my redeemer instead of before my rock and my redeemer so the eighth Yosef comments on this and he said and he goes very slowly through it and he starts off with wait where does this start starts with the very first part he says Elokai and so the show was from Mira again God uh, guard my lips from speaking evil and he says even though that good and bad are given over into the hands of man and there's that's what we have to control God says, I gave you free will. And if I gave you free will, so you have to, that is the definition of free will. I have the choice to do what's good, I have the choice to do bad. It says that's one thing that God does not control. Mm. Everything else he controls. It's going to snow, it's going to rain, it's going to be 35 degrees, it's going to be, and, and where's it, Antarctica or something? Well, there's 30 degrees and here it's 5 degrees, okay? Uh, minus 5, excuse me. So that's got all in God's control. Whether it's going to be a traffic jam, that's God, and I'm going to miss my appointment. That's all God's control. I can't control that. What I can't control is my reaction. What I can't control is whether or not I'm going to fulfill the mitzvah or not fulfill the mitzvah. That's my control. My that's my free will. If I'm going to get angry or not get angry, that's my free will. Okay. So now, and suddenly, when we come to God and we say, "Guard my uh, my uh, tongue from speaking evil." It seems to be a problem here because even though, because we would say that God, God does not control that, that's our free will. So we're saying, so Mar, the son of Rafun, is saying, even though that is that the, uh, the action, good and bad actions are given over to man, still he would request from Hashem to help him to do which is good. Okay? Because what we say is that Hashem will help. If somebody wants to do the mitzvah, Hashem will help that person do the mitzvah. If the commandment, fill the positive commandment. If, on the other hand, I want to sin, Hashem will allow me to sin. He won't help me, 
but he is going to allow that to happen. Again, that's part of free will. But the other way, he's helping me. Okay, when I want to do something right. So here, the rabbi is saying, since I know you're going to help me, so I'm asking to help guard my lip, my uh, my tongue from speaking evil. Fine. And it says further, the difference between uh, being bad or bad actions and deceit is the following. Something bad is bad to the very core. In other words, the mouth and the heart are equal in their uh, in their desire to do evil. Okay? So that's when you say inside and out is guy is really wrong. Okay. As compared to deceitful, there he can speak well, but his heart wants to do bad. Okay. So I act like I'm your friend, and I tell you, oh, it's, uh, it's good to do this, but really, I want you to crash and burn. It's really my desire, but I'm saying it in very nice language. So it's it, that's what we're at, that's what we say to Hashem. Let my and he's going to also distinguish between the tongue and the, the lips. Watch what he does with this. He says the uh, right. So it says the deceit. The, the deceit that one speaks good with his heart or with his uh, the his his lips, but his heart is thinking bad. So that's called my uh, the lips. Why? Because there are two lips. It's split. You have an upper lip and lower lip. Okay. As a result, so he's saying we're uh, that's where they're getting this concept of the lips can speak deceitfully. Because it's two of them, so one again is is totally uh, it's imagery here. We're looking at imagery, so it's one is one is my what's coming out of my mouth sounds very nice, but really my heart is the opposite. Yeah, it's almost like the English instruction he's speaking out of both sides of his mouth. Correct, or he speaks with forked tongue. With a forked tongue. Right, that's exactly what we're saying. It, that did not come from the Native Americans, nor did it come from the other things, uh, but it comes right from here that we're speaking, we're two faced. Two faced, another example of that. Okay? All those expressions, that's what he, what, he, what he was saying to save me from. Then it says, To those who curse my soul, let be silent, and which means, let me be humiliated and not humiliate others. Because what is a natural reaction? That you'll have when somebody tries to humiliate you, you're gonna strike back. You're strike back. You're gonna strike back. So if you're going to strike back, so that would be the normal thing. Again, we learned in, a, in another class that uh, God wants us to. Oh, the class about being holy. So it says that God wants us to work uh, to treat people above our nature, escape our nature. Our nature is very simple. An animal is attacked, it attacks back. Okay? Ultimately, we're animals. But we are, because our nisham, because of our Torah, our soul and our Torah, so that brings us up, that elevates us, if we so, if we so choose. So we can, by defeating our Yetzirah, our evil inclination, we can raise, rise above the natural tendencies we have, and we can serve Hashem in a very nice manner. That also refers to, if somebody's insulting me, my natural reaction is going to be to insult them back. And, and today, the wittier or the more the faster comeback you have, the more the the more people uh, think you're witty. You know, and, okay. So, but he, this Marjorie uh, Rapuna was saying, I don't want to get involved. In that. I'd rather be the ones humiliated and not humiliate others. Why would he want that, by the way? Why would he be praying for that? I mean, why not come back? If we train our kids. Ultimately, that if somebody hits you, you hit them back. You have to defend yourself because you don't want to give them to bullies. Right? If you give them to bullies, you'll always be bullies, we tell them. So why would this why would this rabbi not being hit? He's not being physically hit, he's not, it's not a matter of self defense, but it is a a is verbal assault. So if it's a verbal mm-hmm. assault, why wouldn't I teach my kid to strike back in the same manner? Mm-hmm. You hear the question? Mm-hmm. So the Torah Devora you're lowering yourself to the other person's level. That's one thing. It's certainly one thing, but still, again, I'm protecting myself. So you would think that just like I would hit you, 
protect myself to stop the bullying. What's the best way to stop a bully? Hit the guy, insult him back, embarrass him too. That's all. He's not going to come to you because he wants a weak person. He, she wants a weak person. They don't want anybody that's going to fight back. They're bullies. The very definition of a bully is a coward. He, he surrounds himself with people. Again, he or she surrounds himself with people who will think they're cool for what they're doing. And as long as they have that adulation from the others, they're good. But if you put them alone, if you get them, if you separate them from the crowd, they sometimes can be the nicest people. They don't want, you know, that's not their normal behavior. It's only when they have to put this front on, or they think that they're really being cool, that they do this, and they get trained to do that, okay? That's the, that's the other side of being bullies. They were probably bullied themselves. But besides that, we, like I said, we would normally teach our kids, like I said, to hit back with something. So if somebody is talking, if somebody is trying to put you down, we would say, okay, so return the favor. That's a normal reaction, okay? And the rabbi say, no, it's not good. And the reason he's going with that is we learn later on in the Tome of Devara, the palm tree of Devara by Rabbi Kodavera, that he said the, the best way to, when we do something wrong, when we, uh, when we do an Avera, we, when we sin against Hashem, we're going to be punished. One way or the other, we're going to be punished. There's a consequence. If I do something good, there's a positive consequence. When I do something bad, there's a negative consequence. So life is all consequences. Okay? So if I did something bad, so I have to be punished. Right? So the, what is the best type of punishment? One that's not going to hurt me in a physical manner that will stop me from learning Torah or from stop me from observing Torah. So Rabbi Kodavar in his book says, it's better to be insulted by somebody else because that takes away well, all your sins. The one who insults you gets all of your sins. It's an amazing thing. He gets it from the, the Talmud, which says, if I insult, if, if Ruven insults Shimon, okay, so Ruven gets all of Shimon's sins, mm-hmm. And Shimon gets all of Ruvain's merits until that point. So, you know, when he dies, they're going to read out the list of this is what you did. And Shimon's going to say, well, I, I never did that. I don't remember. Yeah, it's all right. So you're covered. You're covered. Ruben, on the other hand, who got all the sins, will say, I didn't do that sin. You remember when you assaulted Shimon? You got the credit for that. It's glad to see you too. Okay. So that's why... Uh, Madre, uh, Mar, the son of Ravuna, that's possibly one of the reasons he could be saying, I rather guard me, make my soul like, uh, like dust to everything. I mean, to those, I'm, I'm sorry, to those who curse me, let my soul be silent because it's better for me in the long run. I know who I am, by the way. I know that your insults are worthless. I know that you're worthless. So what's, why should I get involved in your fights? That's the that's the other part of this. You can never really get, believe uh, when somebody insults you or wants to berate you. The first thing you have to ask yourself is: Is any part of it true? If it is, so then I should change. If it's not, what's the use of fighting? It? I don't care what you said. You're just trying to insult insult me, sir. So it doesn't mean anything. The expression will be duck off a water's back. Uh, water, sorry, water. I'm tired. Water off a duck back. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> okay. So it's uh, and then it says the nafshi yeah, that my soul should be like dust to everything. And it says just as dust outlasts everything, so also I, it may be your will that I will outlast all these people who are insulting me. And that uh, you will also bless my seed, and it will be like the dust of the earth. What is it, what, why is that so important when you say you, my dust should be like the, my seed should be like the dust of the earth? What does that mean? Well, have a lot of it out there. I'll have a lot of kids. Count not uh, so much you can't count. In other words, my descendants will keep going and going and going. Think about that. All. From Abraham until now, we have no, Abraham, uh, the first Jew, till now, we have no idea whatsoever how many Jews there were, or, in Mr. Shem, will be 
And so she had no idea. When God said, your seed will be uh, like the sand of the ocean, like the stars of the sky, that came through a thousand times over. Like I said, we don't know how many there are. There are Jews that we know, there are Jews we don't know, because they're not on the affiliated list, even to this very day. Okay? You can have few studies after few studies. You're not going to tell us how many Jews there are in the world. You have people who think they're Jews, people who know they're Jews, and so on and so forth. People who aren't Jews, but they think, and you know, there's a whole bunch of things out there. So we don't really know how many Jews we have. And so that would be, let my soul uh, be, uh, let everything work out, so just, I'll, like, I'll be like dust. In other words, I'll be, there'll be, I'll, my descendants will be so numerous, and you, we don't allow that person who's trying to curse me to, uh, to mean anything. And then he also says uh, that if I'm like that, so then I also will not think I'm, uh, I'm I won't become arrogant. Now, if, I, if you would have said, let me be like the star of the sky, everybody's going to look up to me, so that's going to be arrogance. So I don't want arrogance in my life. What I want is to be humble. So that is the way I'm going to learn. If I'm, if I'm arrogant, if I think I'm above you, I can't learn from you, right? The biggest thing we all say is, uh, Rav Meir said it best. He said, I learned a lot from my teachers, more from my colleagues, the most from my students. <laughs> Why? You would think, uh, if I go into class... Who's going to help me do understand anything? I know the subject. I'm the PhD of the, of the room. Okay. So what happens? Somebody's. I ask a question. And somebody says. Somebody answers. It happened just yesterday, actually. Somebody uh, said. I was pointing out something. I asked the question. Somebody else gave a beautiful answer. I never would have thought of the answer. I said, you know that that is really beautiful. I learned from that person mm-hmm. what the what the verse uh, potentially meant more than what everybody says it meant. So it was really a beautiful moment, but that's exactly what's going on. If I was arrogant, I would never have even thought twice to ask the question or to, put, or to even listen to the answer. You can ask any question. Professors like to ask questions all day long. Teachers like to ask questions. But many times they don't answer. They don't want to listen to the answers. Okay. And then he says, open my, and, uh, open my uh, lips. I'm sorry, open my heart to your Torah. It says, what... And here he points out both Torahs. What does that mean? The written Torah and the oral Torah. If I shut down either one of those Torahs, we got both at Sinai. And Moses, when Moses was given the Torah at Sinai, he was given both the positive, uh, the uh, the written and the oral Torah. And this becomes very important to understand because when we, uh, when people are looking at the Torah. For instance, um, the, the, why do women cover the hair? Yeah. This came up from my wife's class. Why do women? Somebody wrote, I guess, on the computer or something. Why do women have to cover the hair? So she explained it's from the Gemara. It's from the uh, the the part in the Torah where it talks about the adult, uh, the suspected adulterous woman, where it says they should take down her hair. So somebody said maybe it means braided. Maybe it means take down the braid. Okay. Yeah. And so, the, shoes, so the, the question was, how do you know that it's really uncovered the hair versus take down the braid of the hair? And so I said, the, an, you, the answer is because that's what the rabbis told us it means. Mm-hmm. How the rabbis know what it meant? Because God told Moses at Sinai what these words mean. So I once to become like that. It's just an explanation, which we write down later on. Because it's oral tradition. It wasn't supposed to be written down. But we were forgetting things, so they wrote it down. But it doesn't mean that they came up on their own with, oh, this is what it must mean. Okay, so it was always there. So that's why he's saying, open my heart to both Torahs. If I just have the written Torah in front of me, but I don't understand that there's a written Torah, I'm not. I'm going to say, oh, the rabbis were brilliant, or they're, or they're crazy. Either way, it can't be one of the... Uh, but that's what, uh, when you look at it, you have to understand, morning, that that's what's going on. That's what he's praying for. And he says... And then he says, and your commandments, let my heart pursue them. And we we're talking about is the neshama, that's the heavenly uh, part of us, our soul, that is to be merit to, uh, to have the mitzvot, because that's called understanding. That when we do the mitzvot, 
we don't, we're not only, again, it's not only just eating or drinking and saying the brachot, the blessings before and after. It's a matter of having an understanding for it. And when I, as the more I do it, the more I develop the mitzvot, the more I'll understand why I'm doing it. That is the, con- the concept of bina. No, it's not just doing it. I know how to put film on, right? I put my film on. We all put film on. Fine. But now to understand what is the relevance of putting them on my bicep, just compared to my hand. It says oh, on your hand. Here I'm putting it on my bicep. This is between your eyes. And I'm putting it up here. Not between my eyes. Uh, here, actually. Not here. Nobody does here. Okay? You never see it hanging like that, right? Not on any movie, or anything else. You, see it, you don't really hear on the movies. They, they're all got wrong on the movies. It has to be up here. Okay? Hey, and it can't be here, it can't be here. It, can't, it has to be very specific. It's all oral tradition. It's to Allah and Moshe Sinai. It's not written anywhere. Yeah. It's just something that God told Moses at Sinai, and that's it. So, but that's what he, uh, that's, uh, but with that, when I do those mitzvot, so I'm building up my understanding of it, because what happens? I put my, I bind my arm, and it's what, so the rabbi says, so you can't, you don't have full range, okay? So they're telling you, you have to, uh, you're the mitzvah should control your physical body. Not only, uh, it's not only a mental thing, it's also physical. So my whole body is getting involved in the mitzvah. And then it says, you should save me from a peg, uh, from a bad hit, which means bad happenings that happen of the time. Yalda is an interesting expression. But it's the happenings of the time, what's happening, save me from that, the bad stuff that's going to happen. If it's going to be a big hurricane, save me from the disaster that the hurricane could wreak upon me. Okay. So, like we had, what, the, we had a couple of power outages this year because of the crazy weather. So, Baruch Hashem, I have a generator that was uh, part of the house when I bought it. And so that is, Hashem saved me from that, that, uh, the Pegara. Okay. <laughs> also, it says, save me from the Yitzhahara, like we say in the, uh, the Gemara. Hashem should remove from you all sickness. And what is that? This is the Yitzhahara. This is the inclination that starts off sweet and ends bitter. I want you to think about that. The yeds are raw, starts off sweet, and ends up bitter. So we do these things, and that's why it's saying save us from sickness, because many times we think, eh, you know, it's, it's really great uh, to eat this stuff, and in the end it makes you sick, okay? Because you eat too much of it, or you're weakening, you're, you're weakening yourself down. It starts off nice, but in the end it's really bitter. Okay, so that's what it is, so... That's also the Yitzhahara. The Yitzhahara, the evil inclination, doesn't just tell you jump off the roof. I mean, that's, that's, that would be simple to say no to. But it says, oh, you have to try this, try that. This would taste so good. That this, this would be a great feeling for you. So, so it starts off really sweet. But like I said, the end is better. And then you find, and you also find that the, if you take the, the numerical value of evil inclination, you'll come up with the word Russia, which means wicked, to tell you that all the ways uh, that anybody, if you go after your desires, your negative desires, that was going to make you a wicked person. Wicked meaning that you're not following the dictates of the Torah. The wicked does not mean that I'm killing people. Okay? Let's understand that. Wicked only means I'm not following Torah. <laughs> and uh, similarly, that you need to guard yourself from this, so we're asking Hashem to do that. And then he says, and all who think badly about me, they are the outside powers. Okay, that's who you should save me from. The outside powers, please save me from all those things. And then, uh, and, the, and he has offered again with, let my mouth and my meditations and my heart be before you, my rock, my redeemer. Good, that's how that is. <laughs> So then you have the next one. It says Rava. Wait, 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 did you talk about the evil woman? He doesn't, but the oh. evil woman would be the same thing. Uh, oh. He doesn't talk about that. I can, I can give you that one. The evil woman is, is we all know that the uh, woman is the one who's running the house. <laughs> At least in the Talmudic, uh, Talmudic times, 
and even to the truth is even today. Unless you have, if you're both working, nine times out of ten, it's the wife is still the one who is running the household. We defer to the wife many times. Okay, certainly in a in the Orthodox home, we're going to defer to her. But I think even in a secular home, the wife is deferred to on most parts. If she's the one who's make uh, unless the husband's just a better coat. But uh, when it comes to other things, and even there, by the way, I still said, I don't care. The mother is still the nurturing one. The kids still go to the mother. It's very strange. And again, I'm talking about no, normal, uh, not normal. Even if the father's doing the What cooking. I'm saying, well, it's not, I'm, the word is not normal. The word is instant. Overall, overall, that, that's what I'm looking for. Overall, yeah. the woman is going to be yeah. the one. Mm-hmm. And like I said, the man is going to be second in control. He's not the boss, although the wife, you know, may make everybody believe he's the boss. But he's really, he knows and she knows. <laughs> and the kids know that they're really the mother's in charge. Okay. So uh, the uh, so when it says in, a bad woman, and what's a bad woman? Again, a bad woman, just like a bad man, would be one who doesn't follow Torah. So save me from that woman who's going to not allow me to fulfill my destiny. Because what we always want is a connecto. We want a woman who's going to be, be our helpmate. Okay? So if she, what does help me mean? To make me rise to the best person I can be, the best Jew I can be. If this woman is not going to do that, so then, even though she may be beautiful and everything else, tremendous, but if she's not helping me spiritually grow, so then what do I need it for? Besides the obvious stuff. But what do I need it for? I, I'm asking Hashem to save me from that. Because my desires will be to marry, to, to be with somebody that is uh, very attractive and, and does what I want to be, my ma- animal desires. Period. Doesn't mean we have ugly wives, we're beautiful wives. But nonetheless, we were, we, when we were going on Shaduch, when we were going on dates, we didn't do, we didn't date in a secular manner. We dated with the concept of uh, we, we, want, we want to get married. And these are what we're looking for. You know, like a drop in the show. This is what we're looking for. And, you know, does, do the two people meet? Do the two people have what it takes to make a, a Jewish family grow? So that's what you're looking for. So, what he was saying was, save me from the, from the evil woman. And that's all he was saying. And he's, by the way, he's mar, which means he doesn't, he, he may not have been married at that point either. I'm not sure if he was married, so because he doesn't have Rav in front of his name, so, so and he doesn't have a name either, except for Mar. Uh, it's hard to believe that Mar would be his name, because who calls a kid Mister? Is it Aramaic for Mister? Aramaic. Mar. Yeah. Mar is Mister. <laughs> so I mean, it could be. Look, I mean, we call our names, we call our kids crazy things, but it's uh, I don't know. Would you call your kid Mister? I, I don't know. But it's, uh, it could be that. But that's what an evil woman would be. Somebody who pulls you away from Torah. So save me from that. And by the way, let's say, you, even if you would marry a, a great woman who was a, a, a tzedekah, a righteous woman, you also are praying that she doesn't turn. Any Anybody can turn. I mean, I can turn overnight. We can all do it. Something happens, and we're asking Hashem to protect us from that. Okay? That's, that's what we're really asking for. At least that's what he was asking for. So now, um, so uh, next one says, "Rava bata salute." Rava, after he finished davening, so he Amrach, he would say the following: "Elokai, my God, Adshlantarti." Before I was formed, the Eni Kedai, I wasn't worthwhile. The Achshash Nasarti, and now that I am formed, in other words, I was already formed, and now I'm born. Keilu Nasarti, it's as if I wasn't formed. I was, I am dust in, uh, in my, in my life, called the former, all the more so when I die. And as I'm dust now, we don't look like dust, right? But we are dust. We're, we're uh, dust and water, and most are put together. But we are. But when we die, all that water goes away, okay? And we turn to bones, and ultimately to dust. 
So, behold, I'm before you, like a vessel that is, that is filled with embarrassment, another type of embarrassment, two words for embarrassment. Here's on Fanecha. It should be the desire before you, Hashem Alakai, my God, my God. That I no longer sin. And that which I have sinned before you. Marek baracha mecha harabim, you should uh, erase, blot out with your great mercy. Of Allah, Aydeh Yisorim, Bechala Imraim, but again, and same thing we just heard before, not through negative uh, uh, afflictions and sicknesses. Vayinu, and this, and this, this uh, statement was also. The Vidway, the confession of Rav Hamnun Nazuta on Yom Kippur. That was also his confession. Uh, we say this, we also say this uh, on Yom Kippur. Ah. If you remember it, okay? So let's go what this means. And he says, again, this is the H. Yosef who's commenting. Let's find it. Right. So the Ajlan and Kedai. So it says, even though that in the, in the Gemara of, of Erevin, there is an argument between Beit Shammai and Beit Halo. The argument is whether or not it was better for the man to have been created. <laughs> is it good for us to be created or not? It was ruled that it would have been better if we were not created. That was the ruling they came up with. Well, the, the entire human race. Correct. correct, correct. <laughs> Why? Because there are more negative commandments than there are positive commandments. Okay, so our existence is negative. That's how they were viewing it. Okay. So because there are more negative commandments than positive commandments, so they said it's better that we should not have been created. But, and that's why he says, before I was created, I wasn't worthwhile because of all the negative. But now that I am created, so it's as if I wasn't informed. So that, that's what he's really going on. Uh, so he says, so, um, yeah, so he says, and this is what he says, it's better that I would not have been created because of the negative things, but now that I am created, in order, to, so please uh, keep me around let me, uh, in order so I can perform the positive commandments. Okay? And, but since, and again, he says, it's as if I was created because I haven't yet fulfilled all of them. Hmm. Can you imagine that? You say, it's an interesting concept. You're saying, I read in the Talmud again. They have the the argument: Should I been created? Should mankind have been formed or not? They said no, because there's more negative commandments than positive commandments. So he says, okay. So before I was born, better I shouldn't have been created. Now that I am born, it's as if I wasn't created. Why? Because I have yet to fulfill. All the positive commandments. Okay? And he says, and since man is born from the uh, Chome, uh, which is uh, material, in other words, the, the uh, uh, flesh and bones, and I'm not just spiritual. So it's a, uh, that's, what he, that's what he's speaking on. Since we're, we're created like that, he says, Certainly, I will not walk after my form, my 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 spiritual form. Since I am material, flesh and blood, I'm not going to walk after my. I'm not going to go after my spiritual side. But I am dust in this life because that's my material. That's what I'm made up of. And all the most of my death, when my spirituality or my soul will separate from the physicality. That will be, and then, so then I'll be back to normal. No, it's still not good. Why? Because I won't be able to fulfill mitzvot. When I'm dead, I can't do anything. I can't put the phone on. I can't wear talit. I can't say brachot. I, I, I don't do anything. I'm dead. The point of it, okay? And that's why it says that uh, a dead person is free from its vote. <laughs> because he can't do anything. That's and it says, Behold, I'm so now that I'm alive. And now 
that I'm in, my, in the uh, full vigor. So be, behold, I'm before you like a vessel that is full of embarrassment. Why? Because the body is like the vessel for the soul. That's how he's viewing it. And so he said that the neshama, my, the soul that is in my body, uh, that is embarrassed about all the bad stuff that's going on that I'm doing. Mm. Think about that. You have a struggle going on. I have my innermost desires, eat, 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 drink, defecate, and so on and so forth. I want to do what I want to do. An animal doesn't think about what it's doing. On the other hand, Hashem gave me, implanted, or inserted, my soul, the heavenly part of me, that which makes me rise above my animal instinct, that which separates me from the animal kingdom. Okay? So that sees what my body is doing, and can't always stop my body. Okay, when I gorge myself, it can't stop me. It's my animal instincts taking over. I'm eating till I, till I uh, either vomit or till I uh, decide enough is enough. But that's my so my body, my my neshama sees that and is embarrassed by that. Why don't you just eat what you need? And by the way, when I'm eating, why should I be eating? What's the only reason for me to be eating or drinking? What's the only reason? You want to? No. That's not the right reason. So we can stay alive and do the mitzvah. To do the mitzvah. To do, uh, the only reason I should be eating, the only reason I should be working out, the only reason I should be having relationships, uh, sexual relations with my wife, the only reason I should do anything in this world is to serve Hashem. That's it. That's my neshama. Everything I do should be for that. Okay? So anything that I don't do, that doesn't have, in other words, anything I do, that doesn't have that goal in mind is embarrassment to my neshama. <laughs> That's what he's saying. An amazing principle. Okay? <laughs> Furthermore, he would be saying, uh, let's understand something. Just because I do it for the sake of Hashem doesn't mean I shouldn't enjoy it. Okay? You, uh, when I'm eating my, my steak and spaghetti or potatoes or, or my chicken soup, I sh- you know, hopefully it tastes good and I'm going to get enjoyment from it, but I shouldn't be eating it for the enjoyment. Or no, because I'm hungry. Oh, and I shouldn't be sleeping because I'm tired. I should be sleeping because I know that if I don't sleep, I won't be able to serve God in the best possible way. That's all. And same thing with eating and drinking and so on and so forth. Okay, so, uh, but again, I should, hopefully I'll appreciate the food. Because it also is from Hashem. And so then he says, after all that's being said and done, she says, wipe away... Uh, Two fingers. Oh, that. So he says to Hashem, "Please don't let me sin anymore." And that which I have sinned before you, erase, erase with your great mercy. So he says, erasing means that it's a type of washing, wash it out, a spiritual washing, as it were. Uh, but not through Yisrael, not through all the uh, the negative things that can happen to me. And the intent here. Is that these that uh, the afflictions that come upon man are a uh, a way for Hashem to punish us, and that is and that when he is um, humiliated, as it were, in the eyes of the creator, when a person is humiliated or discussing, actually discussing, in the eyes of the creator, God forbid. So then Hashem sends these afflictions in order that the, uh, the, the negative things that he has done will be nullified from the world. So it, it, this is rehabilitation. And prison rehabilitation. When we, what happens? A person goes to jail, and uh, at least supposedly goes to jail, does his time or her time, and they come out, they're supposed to be like a new person. Okay? Right? They're supposed to be rehabilitated and so on and so forth. So whenever we have an affliction, that's also a rehabilitation for us. Hashem is cleansing us, as it were, from our afflictions. That's why people, that's what he's saying, that, that people get sick. Now, he also says, there are two types. He said, the, the assurance that come, the afflictions that come upon a person, to clean them out from the sin let them be again. Let them be easy, and that and they'll they'll be to, uh, to make a person pure and clean. Or another reason for afflictions could be to uh, to 
right. make our merits pump up our merits, as it were. Okay, and there, and there was person didn't do anything wrong. The person was a righteous person, didn't didn't sin. Yet God gives that person afflictions. That's what we call Yisurim Shel Alva, the, the uh, afflictions of law, where Hashem is doing it to give you extra merit so that you can get to the next level. As the Gemara in Brachot uh, says, since we're learning that Mesechta, that tractate, it says that uh, there was a rabbi who was sick. So the other rabbi came and said to him, so how are you enjoying your afflictions? Saying, obviously you don't deserve it, you know, it's the next level. <laughs> so the rabbi says, neither the afflictions nor the reward. Yeah. And there's nobody wants to have the afflictions. Because of where I'm going to get to, nobody wants them. So even though it could be Yisor and Shalav, it could be afflictions of love, or Hashem is trying to bring them to the next level, next level, nobody wants it, nobody wants to be sick. It's never a desire of the rabbis to be sick, nobody wants it. But if I get it, I have to assume one of two things. Either I'm being punished for something I've done, and this is just a matter of cleaning me off and fine. Like any uh, person, I have to deal with that. Or it could be that I didn't do anything wrong. And Hashem just wants to bring me to the next level. Either way, I have to just recognize it's from God. And just deal with it accordingly and not complain and not try to get revenge on others for what is happening to me. Uh, that's really what he is, he's, uh, the rabbis are picking up. Okay? And now we'll go to the next one. It says, Rav Sheshe, when he was sitting in a fast day, it was a fast day, or maybe it was his private fast, whatever it was, after he finished morning, uh, davening, Shmon Ezra, he said the following, Ribona Olamet, master of the world, Galoi v'yadul lefanav. It is revealed and known before you. Bizman shevedem mikdash kayim. In the time that the the holy temple in Jerusalem was standing, that's you know where the mosque is right now in Israel. You've seen the pictures of the mosque. Yeah. That's where the holy temple was. Temple mount. That's the temple mount. Okay. The wailing wall. Okay. In the time that the temple was standing, Adam chote. If a person would sin. That is what happens. Umakriv Korban, he would bring a sacrifice. In the Torah, it's stated very specifically that if I sin, I have to bring a certain animal. If I want to bring an, uh, an, uh, if I have a Thanksgiving, another thing, I, I always have to bring uh, animals or bread or uh, grain. So it's a lot of fruit sometimes. So it was a whole bunch of stuff that I had to bring. So here we're talking about the animals. He says, a person sins, you have to bring an animal offering. It says, Aim Akriven Mimanu, but you didn't offer the whole animal. What did you offer? El Achelbo Vidamo. You only offered its fats. In other words, the, uh, and for those who, if you ever looked at an animal, uh, if you ever opened an animal, you'll have a thick, very thick fat. Not like the fat you have on your steak. The fat on the steak is not the same. I think they, that was, they were called like gristle. But the fat is a very thick fat. That's called chalev. On the, on the edible meat, they, they, the butchers trim the fat down. But I'm saying but that's not that's not chalev. That, that's edible eat. That's edible fat. If I would eat that, it's not great for my intestine or what's going on. It's not great for me. But I can eat that. Okay. The other stuff, my body just won't digest. Apparently, the chalev. I don't know. That's what it seems to be. But the chalev is just the forbidden fat. I'm not allowed to have it. And I'm not, I'm not allowed to drink the blood of the animal. Mm. This is, uh, people uh, still drink blood, apparently. Mm. Or it gives a uh, oh, extra boost. These like, uh, paganist cults, uh, are you being well, real? Yeah, I'm saying it. Uh, really? I was, I was in, uh, when I was in yeshiva, so they were talking about uh, if you're on, making rounds, you know, you're a doctor. So you make if you're making round, sometimes an energy drink. You want an energy drink? Yeah. yeah so the, if some people, if some of them realize that they drink blood, human blood, then that gives an instant energy boost. It's not something that people advertise, but the, uh, apparently, it, I mean, it's forbidden. Don't buy one of those unless there's a hex on it. <laughs> oh, it's forbidden to do. It's forbidden to do. But the, I remember that the uh, 
somebody who's in the medical uh, was had studied in the medical profession. I don't think they were practicing at that point, but they said that they know some people who did that. So, but that's the point. That you're drinking it because it gives you an energy boost. Okay, so all our people would drink it in the old days, talking about the biblical times, because they wanted to get the spirit of that life. That's, that's the life force of the animal. Right, right. Pagans. So they would drink it. So we're not allowed to drink either the blood nor eat the fat. Okay? That and that's those parts which we couldn't eat, that's what we gave to God. The animal parts we got to keep. Think about that. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. It's not like you give you not on every sacrifice, but these particular sacrifices we had to give two parts. So he said, uh, and it atoned for him. Now the Achshav, and now Yisavti B'Tanit. I'm sitting in a fast. Mitma eight chel bivit to me, and to me maybe, and it's my uh, my my chelav, my forbidden fast, as it were, and my blood has become diminished through this fast. That lost the weight. So you hear us on Fanechad Shavit, the desire before you, Hashem, Sheyehei Chelbi Udmi, that my fat and my blood, since my eight, that was made less through this fast, Ki Ilu Hikrovti Vanecha, to make it as if it was brought before you, Al Gavayam Mizbeach, on the altar of a Tirtseni, and that it would be, uh, be appeasing for me. <laughs> It would be desires to you, and there's, you'll you'll accept this as my free will off, as my sin offering. Can you imagine? That's that's what you use call it. It's really a uh, fasting. In other words. Say it again, purpose of fasting. In other words. Oh, good. So the Mal, uh, so, I'm sorry. The Marashah says, going on this in the time that the temple was around, and if a man sinned, he says according to the the rabbis, the reason for the kabbono, the reason for the sacrifices is that a person should consider it as if he was obligated to die for his sins, and it's only through the the kindness of God that the soul of the animal can come in the place of his soul. Okay, that's the intent. So, and to this, he says, the time that the temple was built, so and a man sent, and he brought the soul of the animal, which was, like I said, the blood, that's the living, that's the Life force animal and this chaylev, this forbidden fat, in the, in the place of this person's soul. So now that there is no base of mikdash, now that there is no temple that's standing. Behold, I am my fast. It's because of my fasting, my uh, the, the life force of me, namely my my fat and my blood, has become diminished. And so uh, and I and I don't have the the soul of the animal to, in place of my soul to so let my chayla, let my dumb, let my fat and my blood be in place of everything. Understand? So it's really going back the other way. Originally God gave us, according to this, uh, this explanation from the Maja, originally God gave us the animal so that we could put them in our place. But now that the animals aren't here because the temples aren't here, so he's saying, so let's go originally, because I was supposed to see myself as being put up there anyway. Okay? And on top of that, what would you have taken from me? Only my life force, which is my blood, and my chalif. So they've already become diminished because of my fasting. Loss of the weight. I uh, get lightheaded sometimes. So therefore, the blood is a little low, I guess. So that's what he was trying to argue. He said, so let that be, take the place. And we'll stop there. Thank you very much.